Hi, I will today try to solve some examples, some problems on the topic linear momentum, impulse and collisions. In the previous lecture we had seen some uh, equations, formulas related with these topics. Uh, let's solve some examples based on these principles. We have seen that linear momentum of an object was defined as, or can be defined as, its mass times the velocity. And also, the equation f is equal to m times a is now written, rewritten as change in the momentum during a certain time interval. So if the momentum changes with respect to time, then there is a force, maybe in the positive, maybe in the negative sense. If there is no external force, but the critical word here is the external force. Because every object has a several particles in it. So those particles are interacting with each other, but they are called, uh, classified as internal forces. Not just uh, atomic particles in a little object, but there may be a macroscopic system, for instance, uh, a boat and a person, or a bicycle and a person, or a uh, car, train, whatever. Those macroscopic objects that we can see by our eyes uh, are also systems and we can call them closed systems. If you isolate them <coughs> from the environment, it's a system. For example, there is <coughs> something inside, maybe uh, a car or a wagon, a train, etc. and a person in it, maybe more than one person in it, etc. If you isolate the system mentally, from the outside, then this is our system. If there is any external force acting on the system, then we call this external force as the left hand side of this equation, important equation, which is also equal to the second law of Newton, F equals ma. If F is equal to mass times x, the net force applied on the object equals the product of its mass and the acceleration was uh, a quite useful equation. We saw several examples using this equation. However, now we should see it, interpret it in a different way. Since A can be written as delta B by delta T, assuming, uh, immediately say that assuming mass of the object doesn't change. And there are cases, of course, where the mass of the changes, such as a rocket, for instance. If you send a rocket into space, for example, of course, its initial mass is continuously decreasing because some fuel, some gas particles are <coughs> uh, exhausted backward or at a certain angle so that in order to conserve the momentum in x-axis, y-axis, whichever is required, uh, the object, the rocket, is moving, maybe gaining some speed, maybe changing direction. If you send your fuel directly backward, then there's no possibility to change direction. Maybe only the uh, velocity of the rocket increases. But if you, if you are moving in a rocket and you want to change the direction, turn a bit to the right or to the left, and then you have to send the fuel backward in the opposite sense, so that if you send your fuel backward, but not exactly back, backward, but at a certain angle to the left, then of course you move a bit to the right and vice versa. But in those cases we have change in the mass. However, in these problems we will necessarily have no change in the mass of the object. So, uh, although delta B, let me repeat, although delta B uh, is just delta m times v and m times delta v because it is a kind of a derivative of a product. <coughs> so there is no delta m. Mass doesn't change as we assume in these problems that I will solve today. Therefore, there is no term like this and we only have m times delta v. If you divide this by delta t, the time interval during which this change takes place, then this delta v by delta t is just the force on the left hand side and delta v by delta t is just the acceleration. m times acceleration, mass times acceleration, ma, is, it gives us the force. But the critical thing here is this f is not any ordinary f, it should be 
only the external forces. And most of the problems in this chapter and the next maybe uh, are based on the principle where there is no external force. So the components of the system, whether they are atoms in a very small system or they are just two people or a person and a boat, etc., are exchanging momenta so that uh, as a whole one loses some amount, the other gains the same amount. It is based on, most of the problems are based on this principle. There is no external force, so that there is no change in the momentum and we have momentum conservation. Uh, when we come to rotation, for instance, later on <laughs> in the next chapters, when we come to rotation, we will see the angular momentum, which is the counterpart of linear momentum in uh, rotational phenomena. And again, we will have the same idea there. But uh, these quantities will, will be replaced by the corresponding ones. Instead of linear momentum, we will have angular momentum. Instead of force, we will have torque that we will learn there. But now, for the time being, uh, we have only one equation, which is F external equals delta P by delta T. If there is any external force acting on the system, closed system that we isolate from the environment, then if this force acts, on the system during a time delta t, then the momentum changes by delta v, that delta v. So f delta t, you can also write it as f delta t is equal to delta v, which is also which can be written m times delta v. But each of the of these two sides, f delta t or m delta v, as we have seen, can be given a name. It is the impulse and it is represented by capital J uh, the unit, if numbers are given unit is kilogram meters per second or newton times second both are equally valid now let's consider some uh, examples today and try to solve them they will be generally different types of problems let's for instance consider a very simple event of uh, firing a bullet. Let's uh, let me not write it as an example, but just uh, focus on the on the example here. For example, let's say we have a certain gun. Of course, the guns, rifles, etc., are not good objects. Uh, they are sometimes quite harmful, and so we have to uh, uh, avoid using such rifles, of course, uh, as much as possible. However. Uh, here, let's uh, try to concentrate on the topic through the viewpoint of conservation of momentum. So we have two objects. Uh, a rifle, a gun, okay, this is a gun, and here we have a bullet, for instance. This is the bullet, but the important parameters here are the mass of the gun, capital M, and mass of the bullet, little m. Normally, of course, we expect this m is much less than capital M. Please don't confuse and don't inter uh, use them interchangeably. Capital M and little m. <coughs> In the same problem, we have two masses. Of course, this is on the order of some, maybe 5 or 10 kilograms, maybe on the order of a few kilograms. And this is on the order of grams. So, of course, this m is much less than m. But, however, Let's forget about this uh, second piece of information and consider the firing event, effect, event, event of firing. For example, here we have the gun with a bullet in it. A gun of mass capital M with a bullet of mass little m in it before fire and this is our system our system that we isolate from the environment is just this system gun and a bullet and we have the total mass m plus m however there is no velocity so at the beginning there is no velocity is there any force acting on the system? Uh, no, because there is no net force, net external force acting on it. Uh, 
because yeah, of course there is some gravity acting, however, there is also some normal force because we put this object, this system, on a certain floor. Therefore, the two forces cancel each other and there is no net external force. There are external forces, but there is no net external force uh, to have any effect. Therefore, F external is equal to delta B by delta T is the form is the only formula we will use. But since there is no external force acting on the system as a result of force, this delta B turns out to be zero. Delta B means change in the momentum. This delta B is not important here. We are not interested in how much time it takes. We are interested in the no change in the momentum. So delta B is equal to zero means what is delta B or delta of anything? It's final value minus initial value or vice versa depending on the case. P initial minus P final that should be zero so we understand that P initial is equal to P final. What is P initial? Ah, P initial momentum at the beginning before firing. PI is momentum before firing and P final is as its name implies initial and final before and after it is momentum momentum after firing just after firing as we will see Zeros. One is all the terms are zero, nothing occurs. 
everything in that system is just zero, nothing. The other possibility is they are not zero, however, what is the negative of the other? So maybe zero plus zero is zero. But on the other hand, uh, plus 18 minus 18 is also zero. So the second kind of zero now uh, is compatible with this case because one of them is a non-zero number, the other is also a non-zero number. However, they are <coughs> uh, one is negative or the other. So that if you add them up, you get algebraically nothing. Therefore, uh, it is obvious that from this equation, if you want to find Vg, take it to the other side, negative mass of the bullet by mass of the gun times velocity of the bullet. So this is the result. This now minus sign represents that the recoiling is backward in the minus x direction. Uh, maybe you can also solve it using the other sign convention. Uh, assuming at the beginning that anyway the gun is recoiling to the left. So you can anyway take it as negative here. So that this result will be positive. But anyway we have assumed at the beginning that the gun is moving backward in the negative x direction. Vice versa. So one is one convention is not. Uh, however, if you uh, maybe write use the vector convention, vector notation, then it is uh, more explanatory. You may put a vector sign here to indicate the direction also uh, of the velocity of the gun, and here so that of course we understand that the two velocities are opposite. kind of problems even in uh, high school maybe before that etc so this problem uh, doesn't occur to some of us as a new problem but there is maybe a slightly different uh, version of this problem so we should be careful in reading the problems how the quantities are defined what is the uh, or who is the observer for instance these velocities are given with respect to which observer? For instance, I didn't write the, the text, but uh, we assumed immediately that this velocity of the bullet, for instance, uh, if we, or let me write this, we assumed, we assumed that the velocity is defined with respect to an observer who is standing outside at rest. We assumed that the velocity, for instance, we bullet. We assumed the velocity we bullet was measured by an outside observer. There's a person here with some measuring device in a sense to, to uh, get the velocity of the bullet as, the, as it is moving in the air for example two sensors electronic sensors just like the uh, measuring of the ball in the game of tennis in Wimbledon for instance as I said in the previous lecture uh, if a player is serving in the game of tennis just after the serve uh, on the on the board, one can see the velocity of the ball just after the player has served, maybe 186 kilometers per hour, and it is uh, possible to measure, of course, by using two sensors, like electronic sensors, sen sensitive devices uh, that measure the passing time of the ball in front of it. So, if the ball, as the ball passes in front of the First sensor, time is started, the chronometers is started, and when the object, when the ball is passing by the second sensor, the time is 
stopped. So delta t is measured. The time it takes for the ball to cover that distance is measured. On the other hand, that distance is also, of course, known, maybe 5 meters, 6 meters, whatever. So it is easily, assuming there is no acceleration or deceleration in that short interval, neglect the air, uh, air resistance, etc. So that this velocity can be computed after the data uh, are obtained. So assume that there is such a measuring device here to measure the velocity of the bullet as, as it passes in front of the observer. So that we assume that the velocity Vb <coughs> is measured by an outside observer. Okay, and then therefore we obtain the simple result, high school version. There is nothing, maybe nothing new in here. Of course, the momentum is conserved because of that no external force is acting, and then we obtain the velocity of the gun. However, there is now a slight difference in the new case I would give, give here. Assume that there is a device, measuring device, here, a camera for instance, attached to the gun, and velocity of the bullet is measured with respect to this device. Now, there is a slight change. Now, <coughs> assume that uh, a sensor attached to the gun measures the velocity of the bullet VB. So VB is not measured by an outside observer who is standing at rest. It's an inertial frame. Remember, inertia means there's no acceleration, no velocity, no, maybe it velocity, but no acceleration. Here, <coughs> maybe we use another frame, another measuring system, which is measured by a, uh, let's say, a camera or anything attached to the gun. <coughs> so as the gun is recoiling just after firing, the camera, the sensor, is also moving backward, and that device is measuring the velocity of the bullet as VB. So we should write this VB now, convert it to, a, to the observer at rest outside. <coughs> so in the new case, for instance, this will not be the result. The result will be a bit modified. Let's start see that way. <coughs> now this object, as it is thrown here, this object here, the measuring device here, okay, the camera, is measuring this velocity VB, but it is not the velocity VB as measured by the outside observer who is at rest on the ground. All right, but again, of course, again, P initially is zero before firing, there is no velocity at all. But PF now changes a bit. What is PF? Ah, PF now is the following mass of the gun just after fire. Velocity of the gun, which is something a bit different than the previous VG. Velocity of the gun. But then, what happens? Plus this end, but it is not VB anymore, it is VG plus VB. Or if one of them is negative, of course it has to be algebraically uh, added. It means subtracted. So M times <coughs> velocity of the gun, which we don't know yet, plus velocity of the bullet. And this is equal to zero after the equality of the momentum. So that Mvg, or in other words, Vg times M plus M. So we have Vg, the unknown, Vg unknown, but now we have M plus M. And on the other side, we have only the net, this part minus m times, little m times, v bullet. So vg is, let me write it as a vector notation, with a negative sign again, of course. But now, <coughs> uh, it is not just m over m, it is little m 
of course, little lamp here, we have little lamp, divided by some of the masses. It is little lamp, V bullet. Here we have little lamp divided by capital M plus little lamp times V bullet. And with a vector, of course. Now, this is the new value. So, there is only a slight change. Instead of single capital M, we have some of the masses. But if you say, for instance, now anyway, there is a huge difference between the masses. Maybe one is 5 kilograms, the other is, let's say, 50 grams, maybe 1%. Yeah, there may be a huge difference in the masses. However, in the real case, if you want to have the exact value, you should take into account the mass of the bullet as well. However, if uh, if this capital M is much greater than the mass of the bullet, then this M can be neglected because of the summation. Of course, you should keep this, keep it. You shouldn't, although this mass of the bullet is very small with respect to the mass of the gun, uh, we will neglect the small M, but only in cases where we have additional subtraction. If you have only this object here, single uh, parameter little lab, you should keep it. If you neglect this one also, we should say it is zero. But, but it is not zero. VG is not zero. VG has a certain, uh, although small, velocity value. So we shouldn't neglect this M. We should neglect this M only, although they are the same. In the addition and subtraction, we can get rid of neglect, ignore these little terms with respect to the big terms, large terms. However, if there is only a single value in the numerator or denominator, we should keep that. Please keep in mind. So this is the case if, uh, if, the, if a sensor attached to the gun measures the velocity. Otherwise, be careful for the observer. The observer in physics is quite important, not only for uh, guns and bullets, but in other cases, in quantum mechanics, for instance, observer is quite important. The observer uh, may uh, influence what is happening there in atomic topics, for instance. Of course, this is outside the scope of physics 101, but be careful, especially in quantum mechanics and those atomic uh, phenomena, microscopic and atomic phenomena, uh, the observer just by observing what is happening in the system affects to some extent what is happening. So here also it doesn't affect, of course, this observer doesn't influence at all uh, this firing process, but uh, anyway, you should be careful when you read the problems. If the speed VB is measured by an outside observer, the basic rule applies. And it is a simple result. If, however, uh, this velocity is observed, measured by a system which is attached to the moving system of the gun, then you should be careful and take into account this term as well, which was absent here. There is nothing here. M times VB. But now it is not M times VB only, but M times VG plus V. This is the main difference. Now let us have another example. Uh, this time we have a motion at the beginning, a sled is moving and a person in it now uh, starts to move, walk inside the sled and what happens to the sled during this walking time. <coughs> is at the rear back of a sled. Sled is ice load of mass, uh, let's say capital M, 320 kilograms, moving at uh, V0 is equal to, let's say, 5 meters per second 
on friction massages. Of course, here in such problems, we, we neglect the effects of friction on the systems. Uh, on frictionless ice. Then he decides to walk to the front. Sled, and we want to find 
this distance from the front to the front. X is the unknown. Also, the time is unknown for this person to walk the length of 20 meters. So, first part, let's solve the first part, of course. Now, it says, find the velocity, find the time t it takes for the person to arrive from the back to the front. Of course, this process is independent of the velocity of the sled. For example, you, uh, you take a voyage in plane. Okay. In, the, in an aeroplane, you are standing and walking on the aisle from the back to the front. If you want to find the time it takes for you to arrive from the back of the plane to the front, to near the cockpit for instance, then you are not interested in the velocity of the plane. Of course, the plane is moving at the velocity maybe 800 km per hour or 200 km per hour. It is irrespective of the velocity of the plane. You are interested only in your velocity and your distance. Maybe that distance is, let's say, again, 20 meters or so, like this sled, and you are moving at a velocity of, let's say, 1 meter per second. Then it takes you 20 seconds, 20 over 1 equals 20 seconds. On the other hand, the plane is moving at a very high speed of, let's say, 900 kilometers per hour, maybe. So during this uh, 20 second period, of course, the uh, plane covers several kilometers. It is something else. Please don't confuse the topics. All right, uh, now I will be interested only in the inside. So that this time is just length of the sled divided by the velocity of the person. So let's now put the data. 20 meters for the length of the sled divided by 2.5 velocity. So we get time is equal to 8 seconds. So this is the first part. Of course, it takes you 8 seconds to arrive at the front. Or it takes this person 8 seconds to arrive at the front. Now let me consider part, part B. But before solving it, let's first Consider the main idea. If this person doesn't move at all, remains wherever he is, maybe at the back, maybe in the middle, maybe at the front, or anywhere. If nothing inside the sled is moving with respect to the sled, then during this time of eight seconds, the sled can cover a distance of five times eight, which is 40 meters, obviously. However, because this person is moving, maybe forward, maybe backward, then the velocity of the sled changes, maybe positively, maybe negatively, depending on the direction in which the person is moving. Okay? So since this person is walking forward, he tries to slow down the sled a bit. So the real velocity of the sled will be something less than 5 meters per second. We will see how much less than 5. So part B now. Of course, we will use now the conservation of momentum, just like the previous firing problem. Part B. If the person does not move, or didn't move, let's say, if the person did not move, x, the distance covered by the uh, but the sled would be, x would be, x equals velocity which is 5 times 8, so that it would be 40 meters. But of course now, we will see that it is less than, slightly less than 5 meters, uh, 40 meters. Because the velocity will be 
a bit less than 5 meters per second. From the conservation of momentum, can we apply conservation of momentum? Yes, because there is no, as I said before, there is no net external force acting on the system. What is the system? The system is sled plus person, not just person, not just sled. It is the sum of the combination of these two. And the external forces acting on the system cancel each other, so there is no net external force acting. From the conservation of momentum, conservation of momentum, because net external is zero, we can apply the conservation of momentum. Pi will be Pf. Pi initial value means just in this position where the sled and person are moving together at speed v0. What is v0? It is given as 5 meters per second. What is pf? It is, uh, it corresponds to the time, to a time, to a time where the person is moving, walking in the sled. So pi what is it? Pi is equal to mass of the sled plus mass of the person together moving at V0. And P final is now mass of the per, uh, sled is moving at mass, total mass of the is moving at some V sled, which we don't know. Plus mass of the person but that person is moving at a speed which is 2.5 meters per second greater than this unknown Vs. So we have right here, whatever Vs it is here, plus 2.5. And these two things are equal. So now we can apply the data. Let me first write using the parameters. So m plus m times V0 will be m times unknown Vs plus m times unknown Vs and m times 2.5 or VVP, let me just not use 2.5 exactly, it is VP, VP, now this is also VP, but VP is 2.5, m times Vs plus m times n times vp. Now we put the data. So this is just 320 plus 80 kilograms for the masses of the sled and person. v0 by 5 meters per second. Mass 320 times vs, which is unknown. 80 80 times unknown Vs and 80 times 2.5 which is the additional speed of the person. Now there are some cancellations of course. This is 400 times 5 which is 2000 equals 320 times Vs there is a Vs here unknown Vs. 320 plus 80 we have 400 Vs plus 200 so it is 2000 minus 200, so 400 unknown velocity speed is equal to 1800. So canceling them you get uh, 4.5. Now as we see, Vs is a bit less than the initial value. Vs turns out to be 4.5 meters per second. Of course it's a correct value, it cannot be wrong. If you obtain by mistake a value greater than 5, for instance, it would be a big mistake. Because this person, by walking in the same sense as the sled, cannot accelerate, cannot make the sled move faster. So of course this result that we are after would be something less than 5. 
4.5, maybe 4.8, whatever, but never greater than 5 or equal to 5. So Vs now is this one. This is not the uh, result we are after directly, but we are after the distance. So x would be velocity of the sled times t. So that it is velocity now is 4.5, distance is 8 seconds during the walking period. So the result will be 36 meters. Okay? So the result x will be 36 meters. Of course we expect something less than 40. Yes, indeed we found something less than 40, which is 4 meters less. Because of the walking of the person. Now in part C, it is just the opposite case, symmetric situation, where at the beginning, the person is, for instance, this is the road, and that's the sled. Here is the person, but this sled is moving at 5 meters per second. And when they come here, let's say, like this, person now is walking backward with the speed of VP, 2.5 again, but now arrives backwards. So this is the distance now x prime, which we want to find. Uh, x prime, what is this x prime? Covered until the person walks backward. Again, of course, we can immediately understand and guess a result. If, for instance, it is not difficult to make a guess. If, for instance, the person walks from the back to the front and during this period velocity changes by some delta v so that it is 4 meters less than the expected value if the person stayed at rest, then in this new case it would be 4 meters greater. So instead of 40 minus 4, it would be 40 plus 4 and 44 meters we expect. And indeed it will be the result. But let's now show it using conservation of momentum. <coughs> so again, uh, Pi is equal to Pf. So the left hand side doesn't change. Let me immediately write, uh, write the parameters. So we have m plus n multiplied by V0 at the beginning, before the person starts to walk. Then, while he is walking, mass of the Slide, uh, sled times unknown velocity plus mass of the person, a uh, new velocity of the sled, but now we have instead of instead of addition, now we have subtraction because the two vectors are opposite. We have minus Vp. This is the main formula we, we should use at the beginning. The rest is just Substitute in the data. So again, we have 320 plus 80 times 5 equals uh, 320vs plus 80vs, but minus 80 and 2.5. So on the left, we have again 2000. Here we have 400 velocity of the sled. But now we have a minus sign here, minus 200. So we take it to the left as a positive term, not a subtraction, but an addition. So then we have 2200 equals 400 Vs. So the Vs turns out to be 5.5. Uh, not 5 minus 0.5, but it's 5 plus 0.5. This will be the uh, velocity of the step will be 5.5 meters per second, and accordingly, x prime will be 5.5 times the 8 seconds, so it is 44 meters, as expected. x prime will be 44 meters. So let me write a comment here. Let me write a comment. Uh, the person. in the back and remaining at the back. Of course, x will be 40 meters because uh, 5 times 8, 5 meters per second times 8 seconds, 40. 
Second possibility, person is initially at the back, finally at the front. Now this is a, a bit less. Finally, at the front, X turns out to be uh, 36 meters, 40 minus 4. Instead of 36, let me write 40 minus 4. This is maybe better understood. Instead of 40, we have X equals 40 minus 4, so 36. And in the final case, uh, at the beginning, the person is in, uh, in front of it. Then, finally, uh, somewhere here, the person arrives at the back of the sled. However, distance is now greater than expected. So x now, x prime would be 40 plus 4. So this is the main comparison between the three possibilities. And we, what is the work that we've done on the particle during this interaction? B, what is the Short period, 
Some impulse is imparted by the club, by the rod, to the ball, so that the ball gains a certain velocity. That change in the momentum is impulse, also we will find it work done in part B. So J is simply delta B. J, the impulse is simply delta B. But J is given. However, the important thing in such problems is that uh, we should separate the directions and see the x-axis, y-axis, not here but maybe z-axis, separately. So, uh, let's say J in the x-direction is delta B in the x-direction. And J in the y-direction is delta B in the y-direction. If there is also the third component, for example, if there were a certain uh, k value here, plus 4k, for example, and here plus uh, or minus uh, 7k, a third component of the velocity, a third component of the impulse, for example, then we can also consider jz, jz is equal to delta bz, because every uh, axis is independent of the others. So we look at these axis by axis, direction by direction. However, energy, for instance, when we consider the energies, it is the absolute value, one half mv squared. And that v squared is the sum of vx squared and vy squared, vz squared, etc. So energies are uh, not dependent on the directions, but impulse, for instance, depends. So we have only x, x and y components. So we have, for example, a one here. There's a one here, which is jx. Okay. So in x direction, what happens? One for the jx is equal to delta b. What, what is delta b? Delta b is, of course, m times delta b. And it's even, but it is in grams, so we should write this zero. Now let us find part B. What is the work that will be done on the particle during this interaction? Now we will use the work energy theorem because if some work is done on, on a particle, then its kinetic energy changes, maybe positively, maybe negatively. So we will now see what this work is. Part B is that W, remember, is delta K. So we should find the change in the kinetic energy of the particle before and after. We have the initial uh, values, Vi <coughs> was uh, 2i minus 4j meters per second and vf turns out to be, as we have found here, 12i plus 26j meters per second. So delta k, change in the kinetic energy of the particle, is just one half m times difference of the squares of velocities. So it is one half m v v final squared minus v initial squared. But now we will use the resultant of these values. What is vi? vi of course is the square root of 2n minus 4 squares. So from this we get root of, uh, anyway, this square will be taken, so there is no need to write the uh, root, so it will be 4 plus 16, so that it is just 20 meters squared per second squared. And Vf squared is just, this time we will use these components, 12 and 26, so one gives 144, the other gives 676, so totally uh, 820 meters squared per second squared. This is the final value squared. So we will take the difference 
let's do it here. Uh, in an elastic manner. 
So the collision is elastic. We understand that. Uh, in an elastic, uh, elastic manner. The incident, incident means incoming, first one. The incident molecule deviates from the initial direction at an angle of, let's say, 37 degrees.
conservation of momentum. We can say initial momentum in the x direction is final momentum in the x direction. Also, initial momentum in the y direction is final momentum again in the y direction. So we will write two equations. First, let's write them. And then add to this to these the energy conservation. Let me also write these uh, the energy conservation. Uh, energy initial will be energy fine. Of course, we talk about the kinetic energy because potentially there is no change. The, uh, this event occurs on a certain level. There is no, for instance, mg type of potentials or any other spring system. So that potential is out of question in this problem. All the kinetic energy is important, as we will see. Uh, let me say. This is equation 1, that's equation 2, and the other one equation 3. So equation 1 can be written as equation 1 from equation 1. What can we say for the initial and final cases? Initially, for an observer in this system, who is at rest in this reference frame, uh, initial momentum is uh, only from the first object because the second one is at rest. So it is just m, mass of the first object, velocity, I will give 300 later now, just, let me just use the parameters, m times v0 plus nothing from the second target molecule. On the right we have, now we come to this picture, we have both objects moving uh, in these directions. So both of them have an x component in the velocity. So m this one, velocity is V1, which is unknown, and we have cosine 37, because this is the cosine component, that is the sine component, remember. This is V1 sine theta, that is V1, V1 cosine theta. So V1 cos theta, this theta is 37 degrees, plus, because second one is also moving in the same sense, again the same mass m, unknown velocity V2, Cosine of the unknown angle theta. So we can only cancel these m's and also put this uh, put this v zero three hundred. Okay. So in the second uh, second time we can rewrite it as v zero on the left, which is three hundred. So three hundred is equal to v one. Cos 37, but cos and sine 37, we know that sine 37 is 3 over 5, cosine 37 is, remember, 4 over 5, because this is the triangle 3, 4, 5. Alright, so cos 37 is 4 over 5. 4 over 5 times V1, which is unknown, plus these are also both of them are unknowns, V2 cosine theta. So this is uh, the first equation. Of course, there are several unknowns, so we need the other information. From equation two. Now this is the second conservation of momentum. Now we use the vertical axis, y direction. Initially, there is no velocity in the y direction. This one is already at rest. The other one doesn't have a y component, so it is zero. Last zero. What do we have in the last picture, final picture? A component in the positive y direction, a component in the negative y direction. So it is m times v1 times sine, m times v1 times sine 37, negative, because the other is in negative y. Again, mass m, velocity unknown velocity is v2, and sine theta. Maybe we can cancel ends again. And sine 37 is, remember, 3 over 5. So put it to the other part. So then we have 3 over 5 V1 is equal to V2 sine theta. 
this is the second piece of information, sine theta cos theta. And we can write the energy conservation from equation 3. From equation 3, we can say initially there is no contribution from the target molecule, but only from the first one, incident one. Initially, one half n times v0 squared plus 0, one half n times v1 squared, one half n times v2 squared. Now there is no x or y component for the energy because it's a scalar quantity. Again, we can cancel these n's, cancel the one halves, and neglect the zero. So we have this is 300, by the way. And remember that 300 squared, 300 squared is 90,000, but we don't write 90,000, we use the uh, scientific notation of power of 10, 9 times 10 to the 4. So for this square, we write 9 times 10 to the 4. First term is 9 times 10 to the 4 equals V1 squared plus V2 squared. So we have three equations, first one, second one, third one, three independent equations, and we have three unknowns, the two velocities and one angle. So we can solve the problem. Remember that the condition for solving for uh, n unknowns is to have n independent equations. Yes, indeed we have n in three independent equations. But what should be the strategy from this level? From at this stage we can consider that uh, a very famous trigonometry rule now helps us. Uh, we can make use of we can make use of the identity sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1 for any angle. And we know we can take sine theta cos theta from the first two equations, put them in this last one and get one of the V1 and V2 and get also the other one using the other equation. So this is our uh, point of start now. Sine squared theta plus cos squared gives us one. Now let's draw sine theta cos theta from this. For example, from the first one, we can find sine theta. So sine theta is just what? 3 over 5 v1 over v2. We can get cosine theta from the other one. Cosine theta can be taken as uh, 300 minus 4 over 5 v1 all divided by v2. And uh, patiently we will take the squares of these two, add them up and equate it to 1 and see what we get. Three hundred 
times 4 over 5 v1. 4 over 5 v1 plus the square of that 16 over 25 v1 squared all being equal to 1. Because now we have written this equation in the uh, new form having the data v0. Uh, there may be some cancellations. Okay, let's continue. Uh, and of course, don't forget to, to take, sorry, uh, there's one more term. This is all divided by v2 squared. v2 squared. So let me rewrite it. Uh, 9 over 25, or 9 v1 squared over 25 v2 squared, first term. Plus, uh, divided by v2 squared, but what do we have here? 9 times 10 to the 4 minus, let's say, 600. 600 times 4 over 5 v1 plus 16 over 25 v1 squared equal to 1. But the denominators are similar but not the same. So if you multiply and divide the second part by 25, we will get the same denominator. So multiply and divide it by 25, so that we will have single denominator. So here we will have just the same denominator, 25 v2 squared. What do we have in the numerator? 9 v1 squared plus 25 times 9, 25 times 9, 10 to the 4, minus these 25s and 5s will cancel, 20 times 5 times 4, 20 times 600 v1 and plus 25 cancel 16 v1 squared equal to 1. So it requires some uh, patience, unfortunately. Uh, let's continue now. For example, we can add these v1 squared, so we have 25 totally. 25 v1 squared and take this denominator to the right hand side 25 v1 squared plus 25 we don't have to multiply them yet so keep it as a product 25 times 9 10 to the 4 minus 220 times 600 v1 on the right hand side we have 25 v2 squared However, we have a third equation, remember, which is the energy conservation. So instead of v2 squared, we can write, take it to the left hand side as a negative term. So for v2 squared here, we can write the left hand side. So for instance, let me say 25 v1 squared plus 25 times 9 times 10 to the 4 minus 20 times 600 v1 on the right we have what do we have on the right we have 25 times this difference 9 times 10 to the 4 minus v1 squared but if you look at it carefully you see that these two terms are just the same 25 times 9 10 to the 4 it here on those sides so by subtracting, we get rid of these terms. We don't have uh, these anymore, but don't forget to take the second one. So that here we have 25, 25 v1 squared. Another 25 v1 squared coming from the right, so it is also positive. Another 25 v1 squared. This is cancelled. And let's take this one to the right hand side. There is nothing on the right. So we have 20 times 600 times v1. And that part is 50 v1 squared, as we will see. Because we will get make use of these two later, I'm not erase them right now. So we can say C20 
20 plus 25 plus 25. So we have 50v1 squared equals 20 times 600 times v1. So one of these v1s will cancel, let's cancel one of the zeros and v1 will be. So v1 turns out to be uh, 1200 by 5. So v1, we find v1 as a result, v1 is equal to 240 meters per second. So this is one of the final velocities. Okay, so this is one of them. Next, uh, we can make use of, for instance, which one? This one. Okay. Then, using uh, this equation, v2 squared is equal to 9 times 10 to the 4 minus v1 squared. This one. We can find the other velocity, v2. Uh, v2 squared will be 9 times 10 to the 4 minus v1. What is v1 squared? Uh, we can rewrite it as 2.4 times 10 to the 2. If you write it this way, 2.4 10 to the 2, and it will be squared, so that, that it will be 9 times 10 to the 4 minus 2.4 squared. 2.4 squared is simply, after this, we can find the angle, unknown angle theta, uh, using, for instance, this equation, using the equation uh, 3 over 5 v1 is equal to v2 times sine theta. And we have found these two velocities, 3 over 5 times v1, which is 240, is equal to v2, which is 180, and sine theta. So that sine theta turns out to be this factor multiplied by 240 divided by 180. If you cancel them by 60, so this is 4 times 60, this is 3 times 60, then these threes will also cancel and you get sine theta equals 4 over 5. So theta is arc sine 4 over 5 or sine inverse, then uh, theta is sine inverse of 4 over 5. What is that angle? It is the angle 53 degrees. So that theta turns out to be 53 degrees. So this is a uh, summary of what is happening. There was a molecule at rest at the origin, and an identical molecule was coming towards it with some in the initial velocity of 300 meters per second. After this elastic collision, just like two billion balls, one is the incident one is moving here in this direction with V1 final, which is 240, of course, its velocity is at less 240 meters per second at an angle of, let's say, 37 degrees, which was already uh, given in the problem. And the other one is a larger angle, because this is the right angle, by the way, 53 plus 37. So the angle between these two final directions is just a right angle, 90 degrees. 37 in the upper part, 53 in the lower part. So this angle theta turns out to be 53 degrees in this calculation, and this final velocity v2 turns out to be 180 meters per second. So this is a case of uh, a numerical, numerical elastic collision of two gas, two identical gas molecules. Of course, if they had different masses, m1 and m2, but the calculation would be more complicated because every time you would also have and M1 and M2, maybe numerically, maybe parametrically, so the uh, steps will be longer. There will, there will be more steps, unfortunately. However, if they have the same mass, masses will cancel, and it is sort of relatively shorter problem. But there is no shorter way for solving such problems. Uh, we should go through these steps, and this uh, auxiliary equation that we made use of which is the sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1, is quite uh, helpful in such cases and in some other cases. In some other problems, for example, we make use of uh, cosine 2 theta, for example, depending on the uh, text of the problem, cosine 2 theta is 
cos square minus sine squared, for instance. And again, we can make use of them, etc. Now let's say an explosion problem. Explosion uh, is like a like an inelastic collision. Only momentum is constant. Of course, some energy is lost in those uh, in those events. A vessel initially at rest on the xy plane, a vessel initially at rest on the horizontal, so this horizontal is needed because otherwise uh, one might think of the y axis as a, a vertical axis, so there's some g, etc. We don't have any g, any weight of the particles. A vessel initially at rest on the horizontal xy plane explodes into three pieces. Explodes into three pieces. The two pieces having identical mass. move or fly off at, uh, at a perpendicular angle with velocities of or with identical velocities of Now let me give numbers. Velocity is of let's say 30 meters per second. The third piece having, yang, uh, having three times the mass of the others. Of each of the others. Uh, <coughs> move at an unknown angle. Find the final velocity and the angle for the third party. Find the velocity. Of course, find it, but there's no initial speed anyway. So find the velocity. Let's call it V or capital V for instance, capital V and the angle theta. Find the velocity V and the angle theta for this third piece. So, as we understand from the problem, consider an XY system. For instance, this is the XY frame. And at the beginning, we have some object having a certain mass. After the explosion, this is the initial case, by the way, initial, and in the final case, what happens to these particles, components? 
Two identical particles move fly off at a perpendicular angle. So we can choose any angle since it is not uh, specified in the problem. We can choose, for instance, that one of them is moving in this direction with a velocity of let's say 30 meters per second and mass is at one angle. The other is identical one after this explosion is moving perpendicular to this, for example in the y direction, with the same speed 30 meters per second and then it has the same mass m. However, the third particle, third piece, has three times the mass of the other, so it, is, it has mass 3m. And of course we, we should understand that it is moving, for instance, in this direction. Because, for example, this is impossible. So this motion it would be impossible because in this case there is nothing to balance the y value of the momentum. Okay? Both of these particles are moving in positive y, there is nothing in the negative y, so this is impossible. For instance, this direction simply is also impossible. There is nothing to balance the x component and y component. So these are impossible regions, domains. This region, third, four, the other fourth quarter, for instance, is also not possible because in this case, both of them, two particles are moving in the x direction, nothing is moving in the negative x direction. So these are impossible. The only possibility is this fifth part, this quarter. So we assume that, for instance, it is moving, it has a mass three times the others, so this is the mass 3m, and this angle is theta. This theta is unknown, this velocity, let's say capital E is unknown. So first of all, we uh, establish uh, the geometry of the problem from the text. Next, of course, a collision, uh, sorry, an explosion, an explosion, is like an like a, uh, inelastic collision. Is like an inelastic collision where only momentum is conserved but not energy. Because there is a uh, great sound in the blast at the, during the explosion, some chemical energy is turned into thermal energy, etc. So, of course, energy is much energy is lost. The remaining energy is given to the particles that are moving in the form of kinetic energy. But there is no, for instance, uh, no conservation of energy, obviously. Because initially the particle was here, there was no kinetic energy. The, now in the second part, there is some kinetic energy. Where does it come from? It comes from the uh, chemical energy which was already stored in the molecules, atoms, etc. And after the last it turns into some, some energy is lost, of course, maybe a great part is lost. Uh, the remaining energy is transferred into the kinetic energy of the moving particles. Okay, so uh, an explosion is like an inelastic collision where the momentum, of course, momentum is conserved in the x direction, y direction separately. The momentum is conserved. But not energy. But not the energy. In the x direction and y direction, we write the conservation law separately. In x direction, for instance, what can we say? Uh, initially, there was nothing, of course. Pi Pi in the x direction, Pf in the x direction. So initially there was no motion, no velocity, so no momentum. But after that, we have one particle moving in the x direction, m times 30 is the velocity, mass times 30. This one doesn't have any contribution to the x direction, but the other one has negative 
because it is obvious that it would move in this direction. Negative, but three times the mass, it was three times. Unknown velocity v, but this angle is not necessary, it is cosine theta. V and cosine theta. So we can cancel the times and divide by 3. So that V cos theta, for instance, turns out to be 10. This is one of the equations, but there are two unknowns. In the y direction, in y direction we have P initial in the y, P final in the y. But initially again there was nothing, so it was just zero. Now in the second case we have one particle moving in the y, but the other one doesn't give a contribution in the y direction. So only one of them positive, so m uh, 30 is the speed, negative the other one, uh, 3m is the mass for the third piece, 3m, v is the velocity, and now sine theta. And again some cancellations. So v sine theta, v sine theta also turns out to be 10. So if we divide that, what do we get? These are, let's say, equation 1 and equation 2. Why do I have equation 2 by equation 1? By dividing equation 2 by equation 1. What do we get? V sine theta equals 10. V cos theta equals 10. So if you divide them, 10s cancel, Vs cancel. We have tangent theta equals 1. And who, who, what is the angle whose tangent is 1? So we understand that tangent theta is 1, so that theta is tangent inverse of 1, which means theta equals 45 degrees. Once you get the angle, you can use it in maybe this one or the other one to find the final velocity. It is quite easy. Let me do it just here. For instance, V times sine 45 or four, cosine 45, which is the same. Uh, root 2 over 2 root 2 over 2 gives us 10 so it is 20 over root 2 therefore v is numerical value magnitude of the velocity is 20 over root 2 root 2 is 0.4 uh, 200 over 14 100 over 7 almost uh, 14 so v is almost 14 meters per second, a bit less than half of the other velocities. Now in this part of the chapter we, we will talk about the important topic of center of mass. Some different masses 
if there are if there are different masses, for example, if there are several objects having different masses, <coughs> different masses such as <coughs> M1, M2, M3, at different positions x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, etc. Then the, set, the overall center of mass is found by some expression. Then the overall center of mass, in short, sometimes we use cm. This cm doesn't have anything to do with the centimeter, it is center of mass, the abbreviation. Then the overall center of mass can be found by the expression. By the formula. For example, let me complete the picture. For instance, let's say we have an object here, an object, maybe larger object there, a bit larger object there, and finally, for instance, a bigger object, biggest one here. So this is mass M1, M2, M3, M4. Each of them has its own coordinates. So for instance, here it has uh, x1, y1, in short. Here, x2, y2. For instance, the, 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 if you join them, the particles with the axes, so this quantity is, for instance, let me just show one of them, this quantity is x2, that quantity is y2. Similarly for the third one, if you join them with the projections onto the axes, so this short part, or the shorter part, is called y3. This part is called x3. And similarly, for the last one, again, you can join it with the axis. So this part corresponds to x4, and that part y4. For m1, uh, this part is x1, but y1 is just 0 because it's already on the axis, etc. So for this system, having only four particles, for example, the general value, overall center of mass, maybe it corresponds to somewhere here. Let's see where it corresponds to. Again, we do it separately. In the x-axis, y-axis separately. So x, for instance, x center of mass is just, we have a summation divided by another summation. In the upper part, we have masses multiplied by x components of the positions. For instance, here we have m1 x1 plus m2 x2 plus the the, the. And here we have only the masses m1 plus m2. So this is a summation. Let me uh, neglect the summations first. I write the expressions. And then in the compact form, we will use summation sign. m1 plus m2 plus the the. the. So in short, x center of mass will be written as <coughs> summation uh, divided by another summation. Here we have i equals 1 to n mi xi. So these indices are the same, of course, let me use the same color. mi xi divided by again i from 1 to n, but only mi. So this is the uh, expression to find the x component of the center of mass only. Of course, we apply the same idea to the y component, so it is easy to write the y value. So, therefore, y center of mass will be, again, let me just write the compact form, we have a summation divided by another summation. But, of course, let me immediately warn you that these allies do not cancel, please. 
Of course, there is no way to cancel them and get just uh, xi at the end because this is like the weighted average of some uh, maybe exam grades or some votes, etc. So, weighted average because each mass, each mass will be multiplied by its own coordinate. So, there is no cancellation here, please. So, here we have another summation i from 1 to n, and is, in this case, n is 4. n is the total number of particles. Total number of particles, whatever, for example, there are 4 particles now, i from 1 to 4. If there were only 3 of them, i would be 1, 2, 3 only. So it is again here n times i, but not x, but y now. Y i. Instead of x's, we will have y's. Otherwise, they are the same uh, in the same form. So m i in the same form in the denominator i and i is from 1 to n. So this is for the y coordinate. Uh, why do we have a need to calculate the center of mass of a group of particles or a single? Particle will be we seen uh, maybe later on as we do some more problems. For instance, uh, when we come to the rotational topics in chapter 9, for instance, when we come to rotation, angular properties, then for instance, if we have a ball, for instance, if you throw a ball from an initial position to a final position. During this parabolic path, for example, this object, the center of mass is following a trajectory in the parabolic form. On the other hand, it may make rotations around the center of mass. So we will take the, this general motion as a sum of two kinds of motion. One will be the uh, center of mass motion, the other is the motion around the center of mass. Or, for example, if a wheel is, if a car is moving, on a horizontal surface and the wheel is turning. This wheel, for instance, as we see in rotation, not now but in rotation, uh, is making a kind of movement which is the combination of two things. The angular motion uh, will be the sum of, the rolling will be the sum of, uh, the linear movement of the center of mass of the wheel plus the rotation of the object around the center of mass. So it is uh, quite useful, especially for rotational purposes. Now in this chapter we don't have any rotation yet, we don't know what a rotation means yet. In this chapter we have this idea, we will use, make use of it by the following way. Uh, because we still consider the momentum. And so far we, we know we have seen a basic idea. For instance, f external is delta b by delta t. And immediately we concluded that if there is no f external, no net external force acting on the system from outside, then delta b is zero. Delta b is zero means its momentum value, whatever it is at the beginning, is the same afterwards during the motion and at the end. So, uh, also we can now generalize this to the idea of center of mass. If for instance there is no external force acting on the system from outside, then on the one hand its momentum doesn't change, on the other hand we make use of the uh, identity of the center of mass position. So center of mass position, wherever it is at the beginning, is the same at the end and also during the course of the motion, as we will see in the examples. Okay? If, if f external is zero, yes, we have seen that that will be zero. I will not write it now, but I can write the second thing, which is now more important. If f external is zero, the, then <coughs> the position of the overall center of mass, which we find by these expressions, the overall center of mass does not change. So this is the, also the critical conclusion. The initial position, wherever it is, we don't have to know, also by the way, we do not have to know the exact position of the center of mass. 
We may or may not know. However, even though we do not know it, we know that its position does not change. So maybe by making use of this idea, we can find some other unknowns in the problem, as we will see in the examples. First, let me just directly apply this to a simple case to get accustomed to the uh, expression. Let me keep this figure first uh, and give data accordingly and then find the uh, general position. So 0.6 is this much. However, we don't know exactly where 
along that line. To find exactly where it is, we should find the a y center of mass. So y center of mass is, again we do it using now the y data. So mass 1, 1 kilogram times its y value which is 0. 1 times 0 plus 2 times, now we use the second coordinate, 3. 3 times second coordinate 2. 4 times second coordinate minus 3. Divided by again the total mass which is 10. This drops. It is 6 plus another 6 minus 12. Divided by 10. So they cancel. By, by chance it turns out to be 0. So that y center of mass turns out to be 0. Just uh, here. So this is the point, or so this is the point of center of mass. For example, uh, let's say if we have some some plane, for instance, such a uh, perfectly horizontal, for instance, uh, plane, and assume this is. Uh, divided into x and y axis and positions are uh, easily seen and we put these masses 1 kilogram, 2, 3, 4 kilogram, 4 objects for example we put them we take one of them put it at position of v m1 we take another object for instance put it uh, in the place of m2 another one m3, another m4 so this is a plate for instance uh, where should you attach your vertical rope, for instance? At which position should you attach a vertical rope such that when you leave it, uh, this horizontal plate together with the masses on it remains in the horizontal position? Because if you hang it, for instance, by some other position, of course, it just topples over and the masses on it just fall down. But if, for example, after finding this exact position, for instance, this is the plane, you have these x and y axes on this object, and you attach these masses, put them, now consider it as a horizontal object. And if you hang this object, if you hang this object by a rope, by a string, we just uh, is connected to the plate at that center of mass position and then even if I leave my, my take my hand out this system this plate neglect the positive mass of it's a very light plate for us we neglect the mass of the plate itself we didn't take it into account it's a very very light uh, plate for instance massless sort of but there are four objects, these M1, M2, 3 and 4 on it, at the specified positions with the specified masses. And you hang it by this position, for example, which is just the overall center of mass. In that case, this system stays horizontally as if you hold it. But otherwise, if you hang it by some other position, even very near the first one, this one, it is impossible for the system to be to stay in the horizontal position. Anyway, it will uh, topple over, and there is no possibility of keeping it in equilibrium. Uh, but uh, except this simple explanation, we will make use of this idea in the in some problems to find some other unknown quantities. Now let's apply it to a simple case where we have a boat and a person in it and so that as the person moves on the boat or a sled in the previous part uh, a sled was uh, sliding on, on frictionless ice for instance now we don't have movement at the beginning and as, the, as one of the elements that comprise the system moves the rest is moving in the opposite manner to keep the center of mass in the same position during the whole motion as we will see.
uh, in person of mass M stands at the rear of stands at rest at the rear of a boat of mass capital M length capital M Initially, the boat just touches the shore, the key for instance here, the platform, just touches the platform at the shore. Then the person, this person, Then the person walks towards the shore, to, towards the front of the boat. The person walks towards the front of the boat. And therefore, by pushing the boat backward by his feet, causes the boat to move slightly from its initial position. Then uh, the person walks towards the front of the boat so that causes the boat to move slightly. Find the position Uh, find, find the uh, amount of shifting x, find the amount of shifting x when the person arrives at the front. In other words, it, the problem says this is the initial situation. In, in a lake, for instance, it's still water. We need all kinds of waves, etc. In still water, this boat is just touching the key, the, the shore, platform at the shore. So this person, initially at the back, walks now to the left towards the front of the boat. As a result, this boat cannot stay exactly in the same position, especially if the person is a heavy person and the boat is a light one, such as a fiberglass type, for instance, and the person is a very heavy person, such as a sumo wrestler, for instance. In those cases, a very heavy person, very light uh, boat, the effect may be more, uh, more uh, observable. So as a result of this moving to the, in the left direction, the negative x direction, this boat is a bit shifted to the right. So that there is a certain distance of x, which is the amount of shifting, because the boat is shifted a bit to the right. We will find this x in terms of the masses and the length of the boat, of course. What is the physical idea in such problems? The physical idea is the conservation of the general position of the center of mass. Why? because there is no external force acting on the system. What is the system? The system is boat plus person. And on this boat plus person, there is no net external force acting from outside, so that the momentum is conserved. Of course, the momentum is conserved. Momentum is initially zero. It is just like firing a bullet, for instance. Firing a bullet, as we have done previously, it was a there was a gun or a rifle and the bullet was fired and after firing initially momentum was zero, zero plus zero was zero and after firing some positive point, a positive quantity and a negative quantity just cancel each other exactly so the net result is also zero. Similar to that case, we don't have a firing 
now, but we have one part of the system moving in negative x and one part, the remaining part, moving in the positive x. Mass times velocity is the same, but we are not interested in the velocities now. The problem is to find the uh, amount of shifting. If the uh, center of mass remains in the same position, because there is no reason for it to change sideways, there is no uh, no force acting horizontally, just they are exchanging. The person and the boat are just exchanging momenta and they cancel each other. If they cancel each other, there is no reason for the center of mass to change position. Where is it at the beginning? We don't know. But we only know that it is in the same position afterwards, during the whole motion and afterwards. If you draw, uh, let's say, a few pictures during the walking period, for instance, and this is the case. Let me draw uh, some successive moments in such problems. At the beginning, for instance, this is the position. Now let me sign the end of the world in issue position. And here is the person. Let me show the person also by some uh, by red color. So here, for instance, <clears throat> it is just shifted a bit, but where is the person? Somewhere here. As the person is moving still to the left hand part, now we do not know uh, whether it is just at the midpoint of the boat, but let's assume that it is just the center of mass of the boat without any person. Let's say it is just in the middle. You can choose any position as you like, anyway, if you cancel. Assume that this distance eh, is just L over 2, it's just center of mass of the ball. What is the mass? Capital M. Capital M times L over 2 for the, for the ball. Plus, person is here. It, his, his or her mass is M multiplied by L, and there is no other mass, so it is enough to write two things. Divided by sum of the masses. And x center of mass final, x center of mass initial. x center of mass final can be written by looking at this picture. And this distance, the amount of shifting is x, which is unknown. But where was the center of mass of just the boat? In the middle. Now this whole distance is sum of x and l plus 2. So this is mass of the boat times x plus L over 2 plus the person, but the person is just at the distance x, so M times x divided by, of course, the same sum, no mass is L over subtracted. So these are equal. These are, of course, x center of mass initial is x center of mass final by the idea that there is no net force applied from outside. So that there will be cancellations. For first of all, denominators cancel each other. ML over 2 plus NL is equal to, if you open the parentheses, M times X plus M times L over 2 plus little m times X. Again, by subtraction, these two terms cancel each other and we have the unknown X. So X multiplied by M plus M is equal to m times l. So finally, it is easily found that x equals ratio of the masses m plus m multiplied by m. Now let's have a comment here because it is, it is sometimes risky to answer such questions. You may make one may make mistakes uh, to avoid such uh, maybe silly mistakes. We have to be more careful. Comment. One may make mistakes, obviously, but one should be careful to correct it. For instance, here we have little m, lowercase m in the numerator, divided by the sum. First of all, this l shouldn't be uh, forgotten. There should be a distance. Don't forget to write this l. Otherwise, we, have, we want to find the distance on the left, but we have just a unitless ratio, just m over m. So it is wrong. Don't forget to write this out. Second thing is, 
By mistake, one may write, for instance, capital M here. But it will, of course, be a big mistake. Because if you have, for instance, if by mistake, if by mistake, uh, we write x is equal to capital M over capital M plus M times L. This is, of course, a big error, an important error, because we generally talk about a large boat. It doesn't have to be a very light like fiberglass boat. Instead, it may be a ship, for instance, a big ship. Uh, if it is a ship, for instance, if it's a ship, then this M is much, much greater than the mass of the person. For example, we have a very large ship in this position, maybe hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of kilograms. However, there is a person on the deck whose mass is approximately 80 or 90 kilograms. Can you imagine that this person, by just walking from the back of the ship to the front of the ship, so many meters, uh, causes such a big shifting? Because this ratio, if this M is much greater than M, then this M is negligible. So you can neglect this. Otherwise, in the remaining part, these M's cancel all, almost X turns out to be the length of the boat, which is quite unphysical. So this person, by just his own weight uh, and weight walking from the back to the front, cannot cause the big ship to shift almost by its own length. So it is, of course, very uh, silly mistake. Second thing, or third thing, which one must avoid, is the of course, now let's correct it. Another mistake, possible one is, yeah, we write the correct M, little m in the numerator, and also we didn't forget the length, distance L, all right, but in the numerator, if by mistake you write a negative sign, by, if you do some mistake here, for example, and instead of a plus, we write a minus sign, that it is even more than that, <coughs> even a, a worse mistake, because in this case, the subtraction in the denominator. What does it mean? For example, if m is equal to m, why not? In this case, I assume this is not a ship, but a very light fiberglass type of boat whose mass is around, let's say, 150 kilograms. So, for instance, let's use numerical data. For instance, m is equal to 150 kilograms, and the person has the same, may have the same mass. If he is a Sumo wrestler, for instance, 150 kilogram is a typical value of such masses. So in this case, in such a case, the denominator goes to zero. According to your result, for instance, some number, finite number divided by almost zero, makes x go to infinitely large values. So you expect such a thing, for example, a very light boat on which there is a very heavy person, and that person by just walking from the back to the front, causes the sh uh, object, the boat, to go to plus infinity. So these are very uh, important points to avoid. Now using the idea of center of mass, let's find uh, the new position of the general center of mass if some part of a disk, for instance, is excluded, taken out. From a uniform disk of mass M and radius R, the hatchet part is, is excluded. Excluded means taken away. This is the 
restriction. So this part, let's say, quite a large part, is excluded. Take out and this is the radius r and of course the excluded part has a radius of r over 2 so this radius is of course r over 2 part b is a similar case but now we don't have a disk but we have a let's say solid sphere part b if it were a solid sphere of mass, of course uniform, because if it were uniform, then you wouldn't uh, make the following trick to calculate the mass of the excluded part. If it were a solid sphere of mass m, radius r, uh, what would be the position of center of mass for the remaining part? Now let me draw a simple picture here. But now since it's a volume, let me draw some three-dimensional system. So this is the uh, this sphere, but now this part is taken up. So let's consider part A first. Uh, let me draw the picture again. But now, what is the remaining part? It is this hatchet part, black hatchet part. And if you add them up, for instance, this this part plus the remaining part is the full disk without any exclusion. So we apply the formula for center of mass. Remember, x center of mass was let's say m1 x1 plus m2 x2 divided by m1 and m2 type of thing. There are, uh, <coughs> let's say, three objects and two objects, of course, making up the final form, m1 and m2. And you should choose a reference position for us. It is obvious that this level corresponds to zero, zero line. And of course, uh, in the y direction, there is no shifting. Of course, it will be somewhere uh, along the x-axis because this is excluded symmetrically. So we don't know along the x-axis what the new position of x center of mass will be. All right. So this part, red one, has a mass that we call it m. But the total disk has a mass of m. Assume that we know a little m. So x center of mass will be mass of the object, this red part excluded, times its center of mass, but it is to the left of zero origin, so how much? r over 2. So it is m times minus r over 2, plus the remaining mass, uh, let me call it m minus m, because total mass was m, remaining part m minus m, multiplied by the unknown position. This position, let me call it x, not central, but x. So the unknown part here is x, divided by total mass m. But it is equal to the position of the central mass for the last part, full version, full disk. For the full disk, it is just zero. For the total disk, 
x and of mass just corresponds to the origin. So this left hand, uh, this has to be equal to zero. Therefore, this n is not important. And what about the numerator? Uh, what is n? Little n. What is little n? Of course, we can find out what this little n is by the critical word of this uniform. Uniform means everywhere that this has the same density, same uh, uniformity. So that uh, the ratio of the areas corresponds to the ratio of the masses. Since, since it is a uniform disk, the density should be the same everywhere. The mass density, surface density of course, the mass the density should be the same everywhere. Which means ratio of the masses corresponds to ratio of the areas. Ratio of masses should be equal to ratio of areas. What is the ratio of masses? Mass of the just excluded part divided by the total mass before the exclusion is equal to ratio of areas. What is the ratio of this red part? It is, since it's a circle pi times radius squared. What is the radius? R over 2. So it is pi times R over 2 squared divided by pi times R squared. So pi's cancel. When you take R squares cancel, so that little m over capital M is R squared over 4 divided by R squares, so R squares cancel, we get little m over capital M is just 1 fourth. Now let me keep the figure. Again, here so this is the full full list. This part is excluded. All right. From this expression, we have let's take this negative term to the other side. So we have m minus m, m minus m times unknown x equals take it to the other side little m times R over 2. But this little m is one fourth of the total mass, so that we have m minus m over 4 times the unknown is m over 4 times r over 2. Therefore, we have 1 minus 1 fourth is just 3 over 4. 3 over 4 x mx is m over 4 times r over 2. So m's and fours cancel, x turns out to be r over 6. So that x turns out to be r over 6. What is the meaning of this result? When you exclude this part from the full disk, let me divide this into 6 equal pieces. So r over 6 is just this part. It is positive, of course. It means to the right of the origin. So the new position is here. So the center of mass for this part, so this was just zero, center of mass corresponds to here. So that this distance is just one sixth of the remaining part. One sixth of the radius for the remaining part. Now, is it reserved? If it were a solid sphere, three-dimensional objects, this idea would be modified to ratio of masses would be 
ratio of both areas but volumes. Part B. Uh, now M can be found from ratio of masses equaling ratio of not areas but volumes. For example, uh, we may have a basketball similar to this. Now we talk about a volume, three dimensional, instead of a two dimensional disc. Now we have a basketball, for instance, and one part, this part, is uh, more than a tennis ball, a bit larger than a tennis ball. Less than a volleyball, less greater than a tennis ball. So this ball is, is excluded, cut away, taken away from the basketball. But the basketball or any other ball is empty inside, it is vacant. However, we now talk about the solid object. Assume all the ball is filled with material. And again, the taken out object, that part, excluded part, is also uh, massive. There's no empty space inside. So that's why we can take the ratio of volume. So that again, we use the same idea here. Just the same idea, same idea here, same formula. X center of mass. Now this is the mass of the excluded part, M, multiplied by R over 2 again, because I assume that it is corresponding to the same part, having the same uh, radius R over 2, mass M times R over 2, plus M, M minus M, remaining mass times x, which is the quantity we want to find, divided by the total mass, that's equal to zero. But how do we find little m in terms of capital M? We will find it by this idea of ratio of the masses and ratio of the volumes. So little m divided by capital M is now not just pi r squared, but 4 over 3 pi r cubed volume. So the Upper part is 4 over 3 pi r over 2 cubed <laughs> divided by 4 over 3 pi r cubed. There are cancellations, 4 thirds pi is the cancel, r cubed is also cancel. This is r cubed over 8, this is just r cubed. So these also cancel, and we have m over m, 1 over 8. So that little m over capital M is just 1 over 8. Now we will use this ratio uh, in the previous equation and get the result. So applying this expression here, we have m minus m times x and take it to the other side little m times r over 2 m minus m is m minus m over 8 all multiplied by the unknown x is m over 8 again times r over 2 so this is just 7 over 8 1 minus 1 8 is 7 8 so then we have 7 over 8 m times x is m over 8 r over 2 and m over a will cancel and x turns out to be just much less than the previous case because it's a three-dimensional uh, body so x equals r over 14 not just 1 over 6 but the effect is now less in the three-dimensional case so if, it, if this is the total ball solid object and this part is completely excluded so this part is completely excluded from the initial object and if you divide the remaining uh, this uh, radius into 14 equal pieces 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, etc. only one part so this part is just r over 14 so the effect of excluding 
this much object from the surface to the dimensional disk effect then excluding this uh, picture this shape but in three dimensions as a volume from the bigger volume total three dimensional ball so in one in the first is the one over six only when it is shifted for the remaining part the center of mass is shifted one sixth of the radius but if it's a volume three-dimensional body and you exclude the same uh, uh, ratio for the radius half of the r over half of r then the effect is much less even less than half of it not one over twelve one over six, fourteen so the shifting of the general uh, center of mass for the remaining part is only one fourteenth of the radius uh, r over fourteen.